Coming to you from South Pasadena, I'm Colin Marshall. This is the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. I'm sitting down today with Oliver Wang. He's a DJ. He is a podcaster. He teaches sociology at Cal State Long Beach. He writes about a variety of topics like Asian American hip hop, the critical geography of the Kogi barbecue truck, uh, retro soul music, the nature of Universal City Walk, all kinds of things that have deeply fascinated me and probably you as well if you're listening to this. And if you are listening to this, you might know Oliver if you go way back with this podcast from some of the earliest episodes he was hosting and producing for the LARB podcast. Now we're welcoming him back as a guest because it's an event. He's got a book out called Legions of Boom, Filipino-American Mobile DJ Cruise in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're going to talk about it, but first, Oliver, let me start at the present. We'll work back. Why are there so many DJs in the world? Wow, that's, that's I like that we're starting with a small question. By the way, <laughs> it's, it's such a pleasure to, to be sitting here with you. Uh, as someone who helped, uh, you know, get this podcast, uh, started, it's, it feels very full circle to come around and, mm. and speak to the, 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 uh, the very good shepherd of it, uh, in the time <laughs> since. Um, why are there so many DJs out there? Well, I, I think part of it could be explained. I'm going to give you the kind of the boring, well, maybe not that boring sociological explanation, mm. which is that what you saw beginning, especially in the 1970s with changes in DJ technology, um, you know, a decrease in the pricing, which made it more affordable and accessible to people, uh, is that DJing just became popular because the meat to be able to become a DJ, the, the bar was lowered. Mm. Uh, in addition to the general rise of the stature of the DJ, and a lot of this was due to what was happening in discotheques in New York City and other major American cities beginning in the late 60s, and obviously through the disco boom of the 1970s. Right. Um, and then by the time you get to 1980s, especially with the popularity of hip hop, with the popularity and the rising importance of house music, techno music, eventually EDM, you know, the idea, the, the, the figure of the DJ is, uh, inseparable from, I think, how we understand modern music these days. Um, at the point at which you see DJs appear in McDonald's commercials, you know it's basically <laughs> has well gone past the mainstream. It has. I mean, I remember this is, I think, an episode of the LARB podcast you worked on or were involved in in some way, but with Simon Reynolds, the music critic. Yeah, yeah. He had this book, Retromania, with a thesis that I'm still bringing up in conversations today because no, it it's still so fascinates powerful. me. Yeah, absolutely. And tell me if I'm butchering it. I've, it's been a while since I've opened the book, but. The, what I take from it, the way that I hold on to the idea and bring it up in conversation and attribute it to him is that we ran out of ideas musically and now our idea is to recombine what we've already made musically in new ways. That's, that's the modern DJ, yes? Um, yeah. Wow. Again, these are, these are great questions. I think the DJ is certainly an interesting figure within that process mm -hmm. and whether or not DJing itself is the product of a kind of retro maniac, uh, <laughs> if I can describe it as such, uh, impulse or the prognosticator or not, sorry, not prognosticator, progenitor of it. Um, I think it's, it's an interesting question. I think certainly mm -hmm. as DJing culture has grown and we live through what, you know, you could describe as a postmodern pastiche mm. moment. Um, the DJ is an, a really fascinating figure within that. Um, I do think that what DJs do is on one level to recontextualize sort of existing media. I mean, literally, that's kind of what they do right. in the middle of a mix is they're taking bits and pieces of things that can be a little bit of the new, a little bit of the old uh, and recombining them into sort of new ways through the power of the mix. Um, again, whether or not a the DJ as a figure is in, inherently, uh, you know, retro, mini, maniacal. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily the case because, you know, if you think about the cutting edge of new music, DJs are at, at the forefront of that as well. So it's right. not as if they're only playing things from the past. Now, this book about Filipino-American mobile DJ crews in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's yeah. going to sound very specific to it listeners. Is. It's going it to is. sound too specific, but it's a nexus of interest. I mean, DJing itself is a nexus to talk about so many different things. You can talk, obviously, you're a sociologist, and there's many a sociological angle explored in this book of sociology on this phenomenon, but there's the, the music to talk about, which is, as you remark in the book, one of the things you talk about the least, actually, right. is their musical selections, but there's uh, even the sense of urban geography. I mean, this is a story. The story of the story of Filipino American mobile DJ crews is a story of something cool coming from the suburbs. Cool things don't come from the suburbs, right? Yeah, I think that's the general impression that yeah. we have. That you know, our especially the dominant um, what what exists what 
the the idea that we have of the suburbs in the American popular imagination dating back at least you know to the 1950s and further um, is this idea that it's it's a really um, sort of anodyne, you know, culturally bereft space or what exists there is just so milk toast as to be kind of undistinguishable and, un- right. and interesting. And I think what what's interesting about the mobile scene that we see here is that part of what they're doing that's an innovation is uh, ex- ex- for the earliest generation where and just to kind of historicize this for a moment, we're talking about DJs who begin to form into crews in the late 1970s in the Bay Area, and then certainly by the early to mid-1980s is where the scene really blossoms and takes off. And it's happening almost exclusively in suburban neighborhoods of San Francisco and the Bay Area as a whole. So cities like Daly City, Union City, Fremont, parts of uh, San Jose, Vallejo, et cetera. And for the early pioneers in this, so we're talking like the early 80s kids, they're sneaking into nightclubs in San Francisco and then coming back and figuring out how do I replicate the sounds and sights of these discotheques in the city and how can I bring that back to our suburban home garages or Mm -hmm. school gyms or church halls? And so the scene, even though it's certainly influenced by urban dance discotheque culture, what they're doing is figuring out how to translate, transform you know, and and literally and figuratively move those ideas back to suburban spaces. You mentioned Daly City, the suburb of San Francisco, and I feel like, you know, there are certain cities that go with certain countries. Washington, D.C. is known as the Ethiopia outside Ethiopia. Okay. Los Angeles is to some extent a Korea outside Korea. Right. Why is Daly City the Philippines outside the Philippines? I mean, there's any number of reasons for mm. that. And uh, I think it's a combination of its proximity to San Francisco, which was uh, the city in which in the 1970s and 80s, uh, especially in the 1970s following the 1965 Immigration Act, uh, San Francisco becomes the kind of the primary port of landing, both again, figuratively and literally. So a lot of families who are moving or emigrating from the Philippines to the U.S. first end up in San Francisco and specifically in the kind of dense central parts of the city. And then those who have middle class means end up looking for single family housing options. And what's happening during the course of the 1960s and 70s is that you have sort of this generational turnover of housing stock in Daly City, which is still very close to San Francisco. So, I mean, you're literally only going one city over. Right. It's a BART stop that's not that far, as I recall. Right. There's that aspect of it. it there's the aspect that um, it is there is a major medical center there and certainly one. Uh, well, then you're going to have, I mean. Yeah. One of the major professions well are, are going to be Filipino nurses who are, right. who are coming or in, in, in particular Filipina nurses. And so the medical center becomes a big draw. Uh, or one reason why people end up there. Um, you know, I mean, on a, on a more humorous level, one of the theories I've heard, it's because the kind of, um, foggy weather that, uh, Daily City (laughs) is kind of notorious for, uh, reminds some Filipinos of like the weather outside of Manila, for example, which is surrounded by hills too. But I think a lot of it really has to do with the proximity to both, um, uh, San Francisco. Initially, uh, there is the the affordable housing uh, issue. And then certainly at a certain point, once you have a critical mass of people who end up moving to Daly City, that just becomes an incentive in and of itself for other Filipino American families to immigrate there as well. Right. So it, it, the, the, it kind of has a circular um, you know, logic to it at some point. So you, you personally have history with both Northern California and Southern California, both San Francisco and Los Angeles. I mean, what parts of your lives have been devoted to which major cities in California? So I grew up in L.A. I grew up in, in the San Gabriel Valley, which is where we're sitting right now. I grew up here in the 1980s, uh, and then I left to go up to Berkeley for school in the 1990, and I stayed up there for the next 16 years. Mm-hmm. So when I first began this research, this was around 2001, I was still in the middle of grad school. This was The book originally was my dissertation research. Uh, and was there until I got a job at Cal State Long Beach, where I've been now for nine years. And then that was, I mean, we, we moved down, uh, in 2006. So at this point, I've spent basically exactly 16 years in mm-hmm. both Los Angeles and the Bay Area. If I have, if I have my math down right, as of, uh, in about a month's time, in fact, it will be exactly even. Wow. So I really consider myself in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I came of age, uh, in a, in a certain way in Los Angeles as a teenager, but I really, came into adulthood in the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think in terms of how each region has shaped my ideas and my identity, uh, I can't really choose between the two. Right. Um, the Bay was, you know, has had an indelible impact in terms of on me. 
that said, I think moving back to LA um, at this point, almost 10 years ago was a real revelation because as someone who, you know, as a teenager, you don't, for me, at least I didn't really get a sense of Los Angeles as a city, as a region, mm-hmm. um, you know, as a teen, you know, I knew my immediate locale, which was mostly Pasadena, not really much going on back then, arguably not that much going on now. <laughs> and that's, you know, no, I like, I like the Pasadena area. Don't get me wrong. It's better but, connected to the city now. Though. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I never went to Koreatown in the right. 1980s. And I mean, Koreatown didn't exist in the way it does now back then in any case. Right. Certainly, I wasn't hanging out in downtown, which I, I spent a lot of time. Hmm. Uh, you know, I go to Chinatown a lot now, both for culinary and research reasons. And that hmm. was not an area that I spent a lot of time with as a, as a kid. Hmm. So rediscovering L.A. as a grown up has been. Um, incredibly fascinating. You know, you and I have had conversations about this, certainly. Um, and it's just, it's just kind of a, a, a amazing way to rediscover a city that I, I very much took for granted uh, as a young person. Uh, and now seeing it through adult eyes makes me I'm completely fascinated and enthralled with L.A. for all of its uh, ups and downs. That that phrase, yeah, they take it for granted when you grow up here. I notice that with many a native of the Los Angeles region, they do have to rediscover it in that way. Oftentimes, there's exceptions, but I feel like we can contrast that to people from the San Francisco Bay Area. Often natives from there have an automatic, they automatically value the San Francisco Bay Area quite highly. Do you, do you think that notion was born out from your experience meeting people there? Was it just more, was there more of a sense of the pride came with the place rather than having to be somehow achieved as it is here in Los Angeles? You know, that's fascinating. I'd never thought about it, but that strikes me um, as sounding yeah that sounds just about right and mm. i think that i i mean to a certain extent i think people in the bay area and in san francisco in particular they're always there's a, a chip on their shoulder relative to being compared to la because mm. they're both california cities but also new york which is in the other city that sf is i think frequently compared to and sf is because it's a smaller city uh, is always having to kind of throw its elbows out to kind of make room for its itself. And so I right. think the pride that people take in it, it has partially to do with that. And I, I think San Francisco itself and the Bay Area as a whole, you know, it it is this area of – there's so many different ways in which you can process it. I mean, it's it's an area of, of extraordinary natural beauty. Um, San Francisco itself as a city is to me one of the most strangest and most impractical places to build a city <laughs> would be on a peninsula surrounded in hills. Sure. Um, and so the fact that you managed to put a metropolis there is, is I think an impressive achievement of itself. You have the bridges. So there's a lot, there's a lot about the kind of cultural and environmental, um, nature of the Bay Area that I think lends itself to. And the, the I should also add, of course, the, the, you know, the countercultural myths and, right. uh, and, uh, Impressions that that the Bay Area created during the 1960s obviously have a big part to play with it as well. Uh, as someone who lived in Berkeley for a long time, I mean that's that's a huge part of its identity. So I think for all those reasons, uh, the Bay Area holds itself to a certain kind of um, you know prideful standard. And I'm not saying that in any kind of judgmental way. When I was living there, I certainly felt it and, and exhibited those thing those things too. I think L.A. and this is a much longer conversation. You know, I think. Angelinos, on the one hand, I think tend to be kind of comfortable with just the fact that they're from LA in a way they don't mm-hmm. feel like they have to preen about it necessarily. Right, right. Except that I also think that Angelinos have a real inferiority complex compared to New Yorkers, as mm-hmm. as as evinced by that recent New York Times article about how you know people in, <laughs> in New York are moving out here and are discovering that LA is kind of livable. Right. We we actually kind of really great around comparisons like that, which I think partially arises from our own chip on our shoulder from being uh, compared to New York. Better to stay out of the argument entirely. Um, but I do think that I, the ways in which LA tends to be really misrepresented, and I mean, I know this is something that you know quite intimately well, partly because as a, as a monster of our own creation, thanks to Hollywood, um, I think for that reason, people even in LA are surprised to realize how much they love LA uh, or how interesting of a city that it is once they get past the own the stereotypes that Hollywood itself creates about LA. Right. Yeah. You, there is some some work to be done there to get past it, but I mean, as well, there's 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 a lot of a lot of there's a big sense in which in San Francisco, even you feel like everything's going to be on the surface. San Francisco will present itself to you in all its glory, but yeah. there's 
you find things, as you well know, you unearth things, like you unearth the fact that there was this robust Filipino-American DJ culture. I mean, what was what was the clue that led you to discover that there had been this big scene? Or what was it? What was the status when you found out about it? Was it yeah. still kind of going on? Or? No, no. By the time I, I heard about it, it was already um, over, basically, yeah. as far as scenes go. Uh, and the, the way I discovered it was as both a, a music journalist, as a, um, you know, a, a, a budding scholar, as a DJ myself, um, you know, I was intensely aware of the Filipino American scratch DJs mm -hmm. who people like Hubert, Mixmaster Mike, Apollo, Shortcut. I mean, these were all guys who grew up in the Bay Area. They're all Filipino American. They all, uh, world famous, world, uh, you know, dominant DJs. And as I began to interview them for stories, the most, the common, origin story behind all of them is that before they started scratching, they were in these mobile DJ crews. Mm -hmm. And so it was through those conversations that I realized as much as we knew and had been written about the scratch DJs and their community, there was this previous generation of Filipino DJs that basically had created this incredible party scene in the Bay Area throughout the course of the 1980s and through the early 1990s that outside of maybe one or two exceptions, nobody talked about or no one even seemed to know about outside of the scene itself. Right. Um, and as both a journalist and a scholar, that sort of triggered this instant, wow, that's a really good story. I should do something about that. Um, and that's really the genesis of where the book begins. It seems like the scene didn't have the level of self-awareness you would expect either. I mean, you talk about talking to the participants, some of these DJs and others, and they they have to think for a second before they even realize this was a Filipino-American thing, right? Well, it's not that they didn't realize it was a Filipino-American thing. It's just mm -hmm. that for them, the scene itself, what made it interesting had very little to do with the kind of the the predominant ethnic group that was in charge right. of it. In other words, them being Filipino never mapped onto most of the people that I interviewed as being a notable part of this scene. They're just having parties. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And so they, I'm, I'm, you know, they were certainly aware of the size and scope of the scene itself. It's just that it's sort of quote unquote Filipino ness wasn't for them an important dynamic to it. It was, right. it was just something, I mean, they took it for granted to go back to that concept that, yeah, sure, me and my buddies were all Filipino American. We're all part of this scene, but that wasn't, that wasn't what made it interesting. What made it mm -hmm. interesting was all the, the battles and the competitions and the performances and the stagings and all these other things. Uh, it wasn't about the fact that it was, you know, a predominantly Filipino scene. So when and, when was the height? When was the zenith of this scene? How big was it? How many crews were going around doing parties? How frequently over what, how big a space? You know, so some of these questions are hard to answer simply because we don't have a, an easy way of accounting for how many mm -hmm. crews there were. It's not like someone kept a database about this. The best that I can make an educated guess is at minimum 100 probably didn't exceed 200 during the course of the scene. But we're talking about somewhere between a 10 to 15 year history. Mm -hmm. Um, and within that, you know, there were a lot of small crews that would have popped up on the radar for maybe a couple of parties and then disappeared. So it's hard to say, how do we, you know, account for those things? Right. But, you know, I, again, I would say certainly in the dozens, probably well over a hundred crews, um, geographically, you know, the dominant centers for it were Daly city and San Francisco. That's one part union city. Fremont would have been another cluster, San Jose in the South, Vallejo in the North. And then Sacramento and Stockton were, I mean, these are much further cities, much further out, but they're, they're connected to this scene as well. And so they, they, they deserve to be included there. Um, and the duration, I mean, the earliest crew that I could find was this crew out of San Francisco called Sound Explosion. They formed in 1978. Mm -hmm. And then where you peg the end of the scene is much harder to say. I mean, scenes oftentimes have clear beginnings than they have endings. And the scene sort of peters out really by the early to mid 1990s. So the peak probably came what in the mid 80s oh, somewhere. Yeah, the, the peak would probably have been uh, you know between 85 to 88. Uh, you know, there was one big showcase, and the showcase was a uh, an event where you had multiple crews participating, and this was held at the San Mateo Fairgrounds. Mm -hmm. I want to say in 1987, and that was from you know, all testimonials, the, the the single biggest event that was in the scene. So if you wanted to peg the height, it would probably be around 1986, 87. Mm. Now, are we talking, we're talking about Filipino-American DJs. Are these 
exclusively Filipino American parties? I mean, at some of these series, are there are there just giant crowds of all Filipino Americans dancing, or what's going on well, with the audience? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely predominantly, certainly not exclusively. And right. so, in a lot of these crews and the parties themselves, I mean, they're inviting friends and neighbors from schools and their communities, and they're not all Filipino. So it might be I don't know eighty ninety percent, but it's not something where. There, people were guarding the doors to prevent non Filipinos from entering. I mean, it was never right. like that at all. But the thing about the cities that I mentioned before, like Daly City, like Union City, Fremont, is the ways in which Filipino American families end up settling in these areas. You have enough of a critical mass that you can have these parties, which are going to be, you know, 80, 90% Filipino because, right. because of the demographics of that. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, that is, if not unique about the Bay Area compared to other areas where you see Filipino American families settling, I do think it's one of the distinct things about it um, is that you did have just these large enough numbers where you could have all Filipino parties, basically. You mentioned in the book that there's this – one of the ex- explanations for why there, the scene might have been able to build was because of the Filipino – tradition of partying, of throwing a lot of parties for things, of knowing how to knowing how to party, in a literal sense, knowing how to party. And I feel like also when I went to the Philippines last, I just I knew there was the, I guess, stereotype that Filipinos love music mm-hmm. uh, and are shockingly good at performing music on the average. But when I went there, I was like, oh, wow, music really does permeate everything here. I mean, is that was that in your mind as a sort of relevant element of the filipino american dj story just the love of music that is supposedly in the culture yeah well that wasn't something that i went in as an assumption it's certainly something Mm -hmm. that in the the course of doing my interviews would be the the constant theme to explain why did this scene have the size and the longevity and scope that it did compared to because there were certainly mobile crews in the chinese american community in the latino community african-american community etc but something about the Filipino scene in the Bay was just bigger and, 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 and had more of a presence. And, you know, one of the theories that my respondents, I mean, I use the word theory, you know, very, very loosely here <laughs> is simply the idea that, you know, within their families and within their community, they would have parties for any, any kind of event. So right. whether we're talking about birthdays or, uh, graduations or, uh, weddings or debuts, which is, a, which is a kind of a coming of age party, mm-hmm. um, you know, quinceaneras, uh, you know, it just, the, the, the number of possible events was, was vast. And at all mm-hmm. of these events, they wanted music. Music right. was a big part of it. So that, not a party that, if there's no music. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, one of my re- respondents who, himself is Chinese American, but he basically was, was a fixture in the Filipino American scene. Mm-hmm. He made this remark, you know, I'm paraphrasing that as someone who wasn't Filipino and came into the scene as an outsider, I know that in my own Chinese American experience, we just didn't have the same number of parties and music wasn't as big of a deal for that. You could mm-hmm. have a party, but you didn't have to have music. Uh, if you had but, food, maybe you're good. Yeah. In the Filipino community, if you're going to have a party, yeah, of course you're going to have music. And so the, the DJ, the mobile crews had these gigs that were just waiting for them to be able to plug into. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it certainly, as the scene took off, it would become this expectation. If you're going to have a birthday party, yeah, of course you're going to have a DJ crew to do it because you want to have a good party and that's what you need to have that good party so the two things i think very much work hand in hand Mm. um though i would say that this that one of the single biggest reason why the scene takes off is i mean the frequency of parties has certainly partly to do with it but it's also because as an immigrant community filipino american extended families community groups school um and church uh filipino american organizations within those those institutions they all are they create this network what i describe as sort of this kind of an inf- a soft infrastructure if you will that can link different crews to all of these different gigs and the right. more that a crew or a number of crews can get gigs that's helping them make money they can reinvest that money into building the the crews um you know the records and the equipment and all these things uh, that helps capital circulate. And mm-hmm. one of the things that helps the scene grow is you're able to move money among multiple parties. And this is exactly what the Filipino crews were able to benefit from is this tight knit social network within the Filipino American uh, community because of extended family, because of church and school groups uh, that are invested in sort of bringing Filipino Americans together. Reading the book, it's like, yeah, all these factors come together, making this the perfect case study for how a scene forms of some kind. Like, you know, the way you lay it out, I think it would have been a miracle if this scene had not erupted, given all the factors that were there. Like, it's it seems like a perfect storm of a perfect storm of elements, be it social and be it technological, be it musical, that just 
it's uh, maybe it's just the way you have to argue in a book like this, but it seems like that you really get a sense of inevitability to this when you finish reading the book, right? Or when you finish writing it, did it seem like this was an inevitable thing? No, I mean, I, I think for me, this is really kind of a philosophical stance is that mm-hmm. I, I try not to treat um, cultural phenomena as as inevitable because that suggests that there's no sort of human agency involved right. and that that there aren't like a series of of important and in some ways seemingly random events that have to fall into place. So I talk in the book, for example, about that what the scene needed was a certain set of preconditions. Mm-hmm. So, for example, you needed Filipino-American families to move to the Bay Area. Like without that, it'd be very hard to see the scene, um, you know, evolve uh, out of something uh, without that. Um, but as I'm very careful to note, a precondition is not a causal force. In other words, just because you have a, a bunch of conditions on the ground it doesn't mean it's automatically going to gel together to produce whatever it is, the phenomenon that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But without those preconditions, you couldn't have that phenomenon manifest, but you still need some level of human agency of social agency of random happenstance to kind of combine into this magical mixture, which eventually produces whatever it is that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, so to me, it's not that the scene was inevitable, but rather that it depended on this confluence of, a variety of factors to all exist at the same time that made the scene possible. So in 86, 87, when this Filipino-American mobile DJ scene in the Bay Area is peaking, what's going on down here in Los Angeles in the mobile DJ world? Or what's comparable? What, what, what's the most comparable scene? Yeah, I mean, Cerritos. Mm, uh, Cerritos. And this is not something that I'm certainly not an expert on. I haven't done a ton of, con- uh, inter- I haven't done any interviews, really. It's just, it's more anecdotal conversations. Mm-hmm. But you have, similar to what you see in the Bay Area, Cerritos is a key hub for Filipino American families that's they begin to settle there in the 1970s and 80s and similar to what you see in the Bay Area you have Filipino American mobile crews if not predominantly at least certainly pro- they're prominent Filipinos involved in these crews those crews combine um, and form I mean one story that I know of for example is I think four or five different crews out of Cerritos all joined forces to form what's known as United Kingdom. And United Kingdom in the 1980s begins, late 80s and early 90s, begins throwing a series of parties. And then that eventually evolves into a larger entity known as Legend, which mm-hmm. is run by Icy Ice, who's part of the Beat Junkies. The Beat Junkies have a few, you know quite a few prominent Filipino-American DJs, Retmatic, Icy Ice, mm-hmm. Symphony, uh, DJ Babu, uh, who came down from Oxnard. So you do see kind of a similar parallel story happening in Los Angeles and in beyond Cerritos, I think Carson would also be kind of a major area in which oh, this yes. is happening too. Um, that said, from what I've been told, and again, you know, take all of this with a grain of salt, that one of the main differences is because these area, these cities in the South Bay and in Orange County didn't have the same kind of critical mass. A lot of the mobile crews that came out of those areas were much, much more multiracial mm. in comparison to the composition of crews in the Filipino scene, which tended to be, you know, again, not in this exclusively, but predominantly, if not overwhelmingly Filipino American, because the demographics of those areas were able to support a scene like that versus in Southern California, the populations weren't quite as big. They perhaps right. were not as concentrated. And so what you had was Filipino American DJs, but they were in crews that had white, black, Latino DJs right. alongside of them. So growing up in the San Gabriel Valley, you had no awareness of what was going on in Cerritos. <laughs> Am I correct in assuming no, that? I or? mean, I had growing up here, I just had very little idea of anything that was going on anywhere. <laughs> so, see. you know, there, that's for, how it is growing up. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I would be surprised. I would be amazed if there wasn't a mobile scene that was happening out here right. in, in this valley and the other valley, sure. you know, certainly down in, in the South Bay. Um, you know, mobile DJing just really took off the 1980s for a variety of reasons. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I think you go to any major city, you'll find some, you'll find any number of mobile scenes that manifested there. But for me growing up, I mean, my first exposure to what you could describe as a mobile DJing was going to my friend Sanjeev Rabapudi's house and mm-hmm. he would cobble together, um, his equipment from his parents' stereo, stereo equipment and would do, a, you know, I remember going to a garage party there, which is the first time I saw a DJ demonstrating like how beat matching works, right. you know, by switching the pitches on two different turntables. Um, that didn't actually make a huge impression. I mean, it made, I guess in, in retrospect, it must have made some impression because I still have a memory of it. But for me, I didn't really discover and think about DJing as a craft until I got to college in the early 1990s. Um, and so again, to answer your question, I had no awareness of what DJing really was in LA in the 1980s at all. My loss. Seems like an interesting time to 
publish a book about a scene in the 1980s, especially a hip hop scene or a dance scene in the 1980s, because gosh, it's, I, we're, we're really the zeitgeist is looking back to the 80s right now, isn't it? Do you get that sense? Well, I mean, what's the joke? It's that in every generation, you know, becomes really nostalgic for <laughs> for whatever generation came twenty years previous to yeah, that. Yeah, the nineties. So. It was the seventies. Right, right. right. So, uh, you know, actually, I, I guess though technically that means that we should really be revisiting the nineties right now. That's starting to happen, but a little bit creepy that it is. Yeah, it just makes me feel really old, I suppose. Well, do we have a good handle on the nineties though? I mean, I feel like we don't culturally. That's it's not clear yet what well, 90s were well i mean to the extent that the 90s you could argue was really the birth and the spread of kind of postmodernism as the dominant cultural impulse which is sure. if, in which if that's just a pastiche of everything that came before it then how do you make sense of sort of the 90s you know that said though retromania I, by simon reynolds available now right i mean <laughs> i mean pop sort of eats itself and then regurgitates itself and then eats its regurgitation i don't know i mean i don't know how that works with how to yeah. process the 90s i mean I, I'm, i'll be fascinated to see what like early aughts nostalgia looks like Oh, my. Um, you know, which is uh, probably 10 years away, I guess, from happening. In my mind, it's a dry cultural time, really. 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004. I do feel like I'm, I think back and I get nothing from it. Yeah. But maybe, may, maybe you've been more aware culturally. Oh, I'm not. Oh, I, okay. Yeah. I think it's one of those things where you need the benefit of some hindsight. You probably do. With hip hop, though, you know, certainly because the 90s is the golden era and is is really encapsulates so much of the nostalgia that people have for this idealized past of hip hop. I do think that there is, you know, that's one aspect in which there is a pretty good understanding or, or a sense of what the 90s was about, even if right. a lot of it to me is is, is kind of viewed through these rose tinted glasses. Um, I would say though that just a one small thing is the book to me is about DJ culture mm -hmm. and it touches on hip hop peripherally, mm -hmm. but the scene itself was not a hip hop scene, even yeah. though hip hop was one of the major music styles that people were DJing with. But when the scene starts in the late seventies, hip hop hadn't even made its, its journey right. out West yet. And so, you know, the kind of music that was dominant, especially in the, the kind of early parts of it really were not necessarily hip hop, but were electro music and freestyle, which mm -hmm. is a dance form. A uh, new wave was huge. Sure. Right. And then of course the latter remnants of disco and funk are still being played too. So um, the book itself, I would never describe it as a book about hip hop because yeah. it's not it's not like it doesn't exist there. But that's not the identity that these guys took upon themselves, um, at least the kind of the pioneering generation that I spend most of the book focused on. That's why I threw the word dance in there right at the last oh, second. Right, I was right. like uh, catching myself. I know it's not about hip hop, but it's now you look at it and it's like inextricable. The, the way that the way dance music and the way that dance music got played at parties now is so culturally intertwined with the way that hip-hop is like they've yeah. become i don't know how do you put it you you're you've got a better vocabulary for this than i do well i mean d djing hip-hop is what helped djing um i think really cross over in a way that even though and this is this is not to certainly minimize other important dj scenes whether we're talking about house or techno or these days the various permutations of edm but to me hip-hop djs were the ones who were out in front, especially during the course of the 1980s, whether mm -hmm. you're talking about Jam Master J, rest in peace from, you know, Run DMC or Grandmaster DST scratching on Saturday Night Live with, you know, Herbie <laughs> Hancock's Rocket. Yes. They're the ones that really put the kind of performative style of DJ out there uh, for people to understand and to get a, some kind of grasp on. Mm -hmm. So I think that to the extent that we treat DJing and hip hop as, as being interchangeable concepts, even though I think that's an you know, that's, it's, that's incorrect because there's many forms of DJing have nothing to do with hip hop. Right. I understand why there's that association in the popular imagination. Mm -hmm. So in the 1990s, as you say, that's when the, that's when this DJ, the mobile DJ scene by Filipino Americans in the Bay area kind of runs out of gas. What happens to it? It's not any one thing, but it's really a mm -hmm. confluence of different things. Partly they are victims of their own success. And so even though a lot of radio stations and clubs had, had been had ignored the existence of this scene throughout the course of the 1980s at a certain point by the early 90s they realized oh wow you know these these are parties where thousands of kids are going to maybe we should try hiring some of those DJs so that we can benefit from their popularity but the thing is is one of the things you know one of the reasons why you form a crew is because you need help moving all of that equipment to <laughs> yes. parties with a nightclub or a radio station, the equipment's already installed. So yeah. really all you need is just the DJ. You don't need this, the support network. So this chips away at the kind of basic logic of the crew itself. If mm -hmm. you can just be a DJ and you don't necessarily need all these people around you, 
uh, for labor purposes, then you can just focus on your own individual career. So that's one kind of blow to it. Um, certainly the rise of scratch DJing, which really um, takes off in the late 80s and then blows up huge in the early 1990s because of Filipino-American DJs out of the Bay Area. If you are young in Filipino America, I'm sorry, Filipino American in 1983, mm-hmm. the cool thing to do is to be a mobile DJ. If you are young and Filipino American in 1993, the cool thing to do is to become a scratch DJ. You're not right. interested in doing mobile work. Uh, scratching is just much more glamorous and interesting and competitive. Um, import car racing takes off in the same <laughs> time. And again, if we're talking about middle class families with disposable incomes. That's certainly kind of a viable uh, cultural activity for them to take place part in. And I think with any scene, you know, it's going to play out at some point. And, you know, the fact that this scene was able to last as long as it did is pretty remarkable in and of itself. The key thing that sh- that could have happened that would have given that scene new life is if DJs had made the jump from playing records to making records. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if you look at the history of hip hop, hip hop by 1979 was really dying in a lot of places. And people forget this, that it had kind of been burning itself out. But really, rappers delight the fact that they were able to turn this, what used to be kind of a live performance culture into a record. That was, I mean, that was everything in terms of its transformation and its longevity. Mm. And you could certainly argue something was lost in that. But again, if not for that moment, hip hop probably would have just been this kind of very pleasant memory that people had of, of party culture in the 1970s, but would have had no impulse, impact beyond that. I think with the Filipino American mobile scene, if they had been able to make that transition in the way that hip hop did, that house music did, then you know, who knows how history would have played out. But these were high school teenagers. teenagers. They weren't necessarily trying to become record producers. That wasn't part of what they had in mind. Um, you know, because they were an immigrant community that didn't have a deep history and in, in record making, let alone dance record making, there wasn't role models or people or mentors that could have taken them through that. And certainly the existing dance labels in San Francisco had no idea that these kids existed. And so it was, you know, kind of a perfect storm of just for it was a perfect storm in a different direction to explain why they never made that transition in the way that other DJ scenes once they started making records, it created a new kind of generation, a new life. Um, a lot of that energy basically went into the scratch DJing uh, community, mm. I think, because they were they were making records, um, but the mobile scene itself just never benefited or was, it wasn't able to benefit enough from that. Um, and I think that's one reason why the scene fades. So from your research, during your research, you meet a lot of the DJs who were big in the mobile scene in the 80s, you know, right there at the peak. What are they doing now? Who are these Who, who are these men and women? Because there are women yeah. uh, who, who uh, they, did some of them stay in it to some extent, or did, did they just break off completely or patterns there, or anything? Yeah. I mean, there is a small handful of DJs who are still full-time DJs um, mm-hmm. that uh, actually, let me, I have to think about that. I think of the, the older members, so people who started in the early 80s, there are certainly some of them who still DJ on the side, but mm-hmm. it's not their day job. And I don't know if I can think of any of them in which DJing is their actual full-time employment. Right. The younger guys, so these are the late 80s guys, there are certainly some of them who are still full-time DJs and mostly by yeah. doing radio and club work. Um, if you're in the Bay Area, one of the best-known examples would be Rick Lee, who was a Chinese-American DJ but was basically in the Filipino scene. Um, his crew was Styles Beyond Compare. Um, you know, and there are a few crews that still are around and still do mobile work. So Spintronics, which was a major mm-hmm. Daily City crew, they're still around. You can still hire them to do your <laughs> wedding. Um, you know, anybody's going to be tempted after reading the book to do just that. They, I think. they really should because these, you know, I mean, they have 30 years of experience, <laughs> oh, you know, wow. doing this thing. Hmm. Um, but I think, you know, outside of that, again, you got to remember, this was a scene of largely high schoolers. And so right. partly to go back to your previous question, partly what, why the scene fades is because, as they graduate high school and go off to the military or college or work, they're not thinking about turning this into a full-time thing. And so right. they're kind of just finding other things to do. And so, you know, it's, it's very varied. Um, some of them certainly took some of the skills that they learned. So this guy, Francisco Pardorla, uh, mm-hmm. who figures um, in the book a lot, he was, he designed a lot of the flyers back in the day. Right. And then he became a graphic designer. And you can certainly see kind of like this A to B, you know, leap. 
And they're um, cool looking, some of the ones in the book. Right, right. You know, and other people, they use the experience from the business side to yeah. become, you know, get involved into business or doing marketing or promotions. But a lot of them just ended up in things that have nothing to do with DJing in any kind of obvious way. Right. Even though that, you know, if you talk to them about it, DJing had an incredibly formative part of it was an incredibly formative part of their of their growing up and it's something that still keeps them connected to their their friends to this very day but their day jobs have you know nothing obvious to do with djing or entertainment or music so a lot of these guys are sort of cool dads now yeah and <laughs> yeah and i mean in in some the, the most fascinating cases are are where are, are families in which you now have a second generation of djs yeah that is fascinating um, you know i end the book talking about this guy who um uh, dj ever rock or diva rock sorry and he his parents were both djs in the scene so renee Añez was an electric was an electric sounds uh then his mom uh daphne um Añez was one of the very few or was a member of one of the very few all female crews in the scene called the Go-Go's. Right. And I love the idea that their son is now a DJ. <laughs> um, it just seems so appropriate that the son of two DJs would, of course, become a DJ himself. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Scott Simpson, who is a comedian and he's on uh, Maximum Fun podcasts occasionally. He tweets a lot. He had a piece on his Tumblr years ago, something about... I'm a shoe store DJ. My father was a shoe store DJ. My father's father was a shoe store DJ. And you can see why that's funny, especially in 2006 or so when it came out. Uh, just taking this totally ephemeral phenomenon of shoe store DJing yeah. and making it into this generational thing. But in this, in Legions of Boom, you know, you read about this is something more substantial than shoe store DJing. This is like actual techniques getting passed down. You know, there's a lot getting passed down, right? There's a lot of, uh, you talk about people teaching their kids to actually beat match and bringing back to some sense a smoother form of DJing rather than the sharper form that's become popular today, right? Um, I don't know if I, I don't know if I mentioned that in the book necessarily, but I, I oh, oh actually, did I make that up? No, 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 sure? no. I think I know what you're talking about to some extent, which is sort of you know the the primary style that emerges out of the '80s is what some describe as kind of party rocking mm. and. A lot of that is about knowing how to segue, knowing how to mix, and doing a style in which once the music begins, there's no break in the music throughout mm. the course of the evening. I mean, I would say that that in general, you're not going to go to any place to listen to a DJ mix where there's going to be like clear breaks. No one's going to be <laughs> no one's going to be fading out a song and fading it's a song. Three up. seconds later, right? A song, right. Yeah. It's not like a radio listening to a radio <laughs> station. Um, I, I think the difference is with party rocking, it was sort of a return to a form that scratch DJing because it is much more, you know, scratching itself is all about creating breaks, right? It's, it's what draws attention to itself. And party rocking is to create a more seamless style that plays effectively in the background so that people can just focus on dancing. So I think that's probably perhaps what you're, what you're mentioning. I would say that it, to me, it's not surprising that there would be you know, a younger generation of these guys, uh, kids becoming DJs, because even though the technology and the styles of DJing have changed, the basic power of DJing is still compelling for people, which is mm. that you command the crowd. You get to move the crowd through your musical selections, through your mixing styles. And, you know, the appeal of DJing is no less resonant now in 2015 as it was in 1985. And is the appeal when you're DJing yourself the same to you now as it was when you began? Um, I mean, my impulse is to say yes. I'm mm. just sort of hesitating to think about what might be different about it. But, mm. you know, I just did, um, you know, I DJ at a wedding in Little Rock, Arkansas a couple of weeks back. And, you know, that, it, which was a, it was a really great fun party. And the moment at which you can just drop, you, you feel like you have the power to drop any song and it's going to have this mm. great visceral response from the audience. I mean, that's sort of the best feeling in the world. And it's right. a feeling that, you know, you are impacting the collective emotional state of this room through nothing more perhaps than just the songs that you're choosing from. Um, and I think that when I first started DJing, that was certainly part of it. I mean, that, that, that same basic idea of that relationship you have with the audience, that they trust you enough to surrender their kind of emotional state to you. Um, and that you want to be very careful to how you kind of, you know, take care of that throughout the course of the evening. Um, I think that's still the core impulse around why people DJ then, now, and, and into the future. 
In the section of the book where you talk about why you don't talk that much about the music they actually played, you mentioned something oh, yeah. like, you say that, you know, you might as well, it's interesting, it could be interesting to talk about that, what the DJs played, but you might also be, you might as well talk about the taste of the audience as well. I mean, the people on the floor and the, the DJ, they're, there's a relationship there where the taste of one is dependent upon the taste of the other or interacts with the taste of the other. You yeah. can't separate. The DJ is not just playing what comes to mind. Uh, right. He needs to know. What does the DJ need to know about the taste of the partiers? What can he know? I guess there's that. How can he know it? Well, I mean, you're drawing that from a lot of inferences, mm -hmm. right? It's partly what's big in on the radio or I guess yeah. these days on YouTube or what have you. <laughs> um, you know, you have a sense of what the hits are. Those are sort of the, the kind of your go to easy songs that if you really need to get the crowd going, that you can always have those in your back pocket. Right. It's a little bit like shooting fish, you know, in a barrel. Like if I'm at a party at any kind of conventional party, I know Iggy Azalea's fancy <laughs> is going to go over well, you know, for the most part. Right. Um, but I think that throughout the course of the evening, partly what you're doing as the DJ is you're just getting a sense in terms of tempo, in terms of the feel of the songs, what is the crowd resonating with? Mm. And that'll give you these kind of subtle clues as to where you can try to push things. And sometimes, certainly this has happened to me, you push too far, you kind of start losing dancers, and then you need to find a way to hopefully organically kind of get back yeah. to building and maintaining that trust. But don't oversteer. Right, exactly. I mean, I, you know, I was at a... Uh, a panel that uh, Quest left from the Roots was talking about. He DJs a lot outside of his, his you know, his, his other work. And he, I, I, I'm paraphrasing here, but he was talking about how, you know, at a DJ gig, there is this sort of trust that the audience and the crowd gives to you and that your job is to not lose that trust throughout the course of the evening. And so right. a lot of it is, is figuring out how do you build tempo and emotional swells you don't want to burn out a crowd immediately by just mm. playing all the hits right off the bat because right. then what are you going to do for the rest of the evening and yeah. so there's definitely that kind of this narrative and this journey that you have to take people through and a lot of that as a dj the skill in djing i think is really figuring out how do you create that story for that audience throughout the course of an evening um and you know for me i don't consider myself an expert at that at all it's still mm. something that i'm i'm learning uh, all the time about how to kind of work that out. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of what makes DJing challenging and it makes it fun is to when you kind of learn new things about yourself and about the audience. There's a sense in which it's become so much easier, as you said at the very beginning, to be a DJ. Easier in the sense that the bar is lower. Mm -hmm. Technologically, you can buy the gear, you know what gear you need to buy. The information is there on how to do it. You can learn from YouTube how to do the techniques you need to do. Yeah. But, and this is a big but, you had your box of records in 1979. Now you have every recorded sound ever made, yeah. seemingly. That seems like an overwhelming problem if I were to become a DJ. Yeah, it's yeah. just like, how on earth do I handle this? Like, how do DJs handle that in 2015? Yeah, I mean, I call it the infinite playlist. And, yeah. and you know, the other term that people uh, apply to it is, is analysis paralysis. Is that yeah. when you're given too many choices, then you just sort of freeze up. And I, look, I've, absolutely have had that happen to me because when I first started, if you're packing for a gig, you can only bring so many records with you physically. I mean, that's kind of why you would have crews is so they could bring more records. But if you're just by yourself, you know, I'm not going to bring more than maybe one or two bags of records, which right. means that if I'm going to be set up for four hours in the evening, I'm being very selective in what I'm bringing. And those are the only tools I have. Like mm -hmm. I got to make it work and giving yourself that kind of constraint in some ways forces a certain kind of creativity because you learn yeah. to just work with what you have. The problem that I find as someone who's made the transition to using Serato, which is a very popular digital DJing system, is that when I have a playlist of literally 10,000 songs to choose from, then I don't really know. Then I, I just get confronted with too many choices as, right. as opposed to when I first started, I could just flip through all my records in a matter of seconds. And again, that's all I have with me. That's all I, I need to make it work with that. Right. The more songs you have, the more you feel like, well, maybe I should look at this playlist that I haven't like messed with in a while. And then you realize, oh, my God, three minutes have gone by. I got to get the next song on. So I think for me, the way that I've learned to deal with it is I do a lot of pre-prep. And so even though DJing is supposed to have a certain kind of aura of um, of of uh, not it's what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, spontaneity. Thank spontaneity. you. I was going to say go. simultaneity. I'm like, that's not the right word. Spontaneity. No, spontaneity. Right. Sure. DJ's supposed to have a certain degree of, of spontaneity to it, 
But for me, I feel like I can perform better for the audience if I prep ahead of time right. by beginning to at least f- organize different playlists of songs that I'm going to be drawn from. Yeah. And, and, and in a lot of ways, it's kind of like that process of just prepping your box that you're going to bring with you. Mm-hmm. And so it's like... It's not as obvious, but you got to do it. Yeah. And for me, it's 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 I try to force myself to not bring, to not pack the same songs into those digital playlists right. every week because then stuff gets really boring for everybody. And that I will put new songs in there just to force myself or remind myself you should try some new stuff right. and not always go back to your old favorites. Yeah, you got to narrow. You got to narrow the landscape available to you, so you can work within it. And you know, this is—it's a cliche to talk about constraints being almost uh, constraints being necessary conditions for art. But yeah. it's really true. You need the constraints. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, it's like I said. I was, I was saying, a listener might think a book on Filipino American mobile DJs in the '80s in San Francisco Bay Area seems too specific. But really, once you dial it down that far, when you're researching, then the whole thing opens up, right? I mean, right. how did you? How did you find the degree of specificity you needed? And I realize, as you say, this was at first a dissertation. Yeah. How did you find the degree of specificity you needed to get a rich subject, to get uh, enough, to get to the point where you thought, now I can really do something? I, I mean, I think a lot of ways, because the scene itself had already ended, it, there was a built-in narrative, which right. is, you know, I want to know how to begin. Who was there at the very beginning? What were the, what were the conditions like around then? How did the scene grow and how did it create sort of these internal rules for itself and, and whatnot? Um, and so there were and, – and certainly because my entry point into this story was initially through the second generation of scratch DJs, I knew that there was some – tangent there was an offshoot at some point which also created a kind of an an, a, a, an easy narrative path for me to take right. so there was never really a sense that i had to you know i knew going into this that there was a pretty great story that that could tell itself in a lot of ways mm-hmm. um you know i think it, that said i did make certain choices in terms of i focus a lot more about the early years of the scene than i do the back end of it and so people who um, you know, came up in the ninth, in the late eighties might feel like, you know, you didn't really talk much about our, our generation. And it's true. I didn't yes. because, you know, I was making choices about which parts I thought were more interesting. Um, I made geographic choices. So the scene is the, sorry, the book is very heavily focused on crews out of San Francisco and Daly city, not necessarily as much from, um, other, other parts of the Bay, which were equally vibrant. Right. And again, for me, I mean, just to make this clear, I never set out to for the book to be a definitive, comprehensive study. To me, I'm looking at interesting ideas and, and situations within it. Mm. But um, by all means, I really want other people to go out and do other research um, mm-hmm. about, you know, just the San Jose scene or what was happening in Vallejo or looking at this younger generation. Um, you know, my book should definitely not be the end all be all and it was never intended to be. As you say in the book, yeah, you feel like, yeah, I'll start as a pioneer here in this, but the the subsequent pioneers haven't really followed yet, have they? No, and I, I you know, I, I mean, there's any number of reasons for that. I think if we're talking about within scholarship, there's just not a lot of work that gets done around um, uh, Asian Americans and popular culture as a whole. I mean, and this is for me as, as someone who considers himself to a certain degree an Asian Americanist as a scholar, it's been kind of my perennial chip on my shoulder for you know, 20 years, which is that I'm really interested in how Asian Americans engage in forms of popular culture Mm -hmm. because that, you know, that's, that's me. I engage in popular culture. My daughter who's growing up, who's, who's half Japanese American, half Chinese American. That's certainly a huge part of her life. Uh, My students who are Asian American. They're always engaged in pop culture. But then you look at what we write about within as Asian American scholars when it comes to the realm of culture and it's, it feels like it's 90% lit. And I'm probably mm-hmm. overstating that by maybe 10%. But <laughs> I mean, lit, overwhelmingly, <gasps> predominantly, the amount of scholarship that's turned yeah. out is about Asian American literature and to a lesser extent, theater and film. Right. But, you know, for music or any other more what would be considered a pop form, it's very little of that. And as people have pointed out to me, if you're interested in those topics, your, your impulse probably is not to go to graduate school to study it. Your impulse right. is probably to go and make that stuff. So I'm sort of the rare example of someone who was intensely interested in this and also wanted to be you know, a scholar. And so I was able to combine those interests. 
But you know, if you want, if you're really into Asian American literature, the the route into academia seems a lot more intuitive, right. and that generates a lot of Asian American lit scholars, and God bless them. Um, there but, are departments for that. There's no mobile DJ history departments, are there? Right, exactly. And so, I mean, there's my book. There's uh, Tony uh, Tongson's book on Filipino mm-hmm. DJs, which I think is actually called Filipino DJs, and he looks mm-hmm. he looks mostly at the at the at the scratch scenes. He's looking at the, the younger generation, basically, um, and you know. This history, the at least of the scratch DJs, has been discussed in other people's work. I'm thinking of Mark Katz. I'm thinking of uh, Bruce Stern Broughton's book, Last Night a DJ Saved My Life. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was hoping when I first began this research in the early 2000s that there would be other people who would be interested in looking at the mobile scene in particular because it's such an amazing, rich, massive scene. Right. And you know, 15 years later – there doesn't seem to have been that many other people that have have taken a glance into this. And, you know, I, again, I could theorize as to why that is, but honestly, I'd be more interested in just cajoling people and saying <laughs> like, there's so much more work that could be done here as yeah. journalists, as chroniclers, as scholars, like, please go and do it. Don't let, don't let my, my work be the only thing that stands out there. Cause that it's, would it's be not done. It's not done. It's yeah. not. And it, it's, it's, there's this, yeah, I, I looked at really a fragment, a sliver within something that's so much more rich. Uh, and I really hope that um, other people are, are interested in, in going and exploring this because God knows there's so many more other stories out there. To take it back to the Los Angeles and San Francisco thing, I mean, when both, both cities are, are pretty rich, are pretty rich, rich, almost laboratories for people interested in Asian American popular culture. But tell me, I mean, given your experience half in one, half in the other, how how do they differ in terms of what type of Asian American popular culture you see. I mean, I said you've written about the, the Roy Choi's Kogi trucks, which are now an icon of Los Angeles as much as we can even have icons here. What's, what's the difference in character of the kind of pop culture endeavors you see Asian Americans doing up there and down here? Oh my God. Again, another great question, which I've never thought about. <laughs> Now's the time. I mean, to me, I've always processed the differences in, in, the communities of Asian Americans in the two areas, I think for one, it in the Bay, things just feel a lot more intimate. Uh, mm. and, and I'm thinking primarily of my background with people in what you could describe as the Asian American progressive left, people who are working in the community. Um, and it, things are just much more close knit up there because it's smaller, it's right. more intimate. You know, it's kind of a fishbowl and everyone sort of knows what's going on. Everyone else is, has some idea of your business and it feels <laughs> small in that way as well. Yeah, yeah. But it also is, is a very powerful form of kind of community building as a result. Um, I mean, I guess I, I, I would hesitate to make any, any kind of broad sweep because I, I sweeps of, of, of to answer your question, if only because I, I haven't really thought that much about how does, culture or cultural activities manifest differently in the two regions. Right. Um, I mean, the things that pop to my mind is that actually, I, I can't even really think of what those differences are, which is not to say that there aren't differences. Right. Strangely, you're the first person to really ever ask that of me. And I've never really thought that deeply about. Do you ever get the sense? I mean, like just when you're in one place or the other, you see something happening in San Francisco, you see something happening in Los Angeles, Los Angeles. You're like, yeah, that's only here. That's only going to be in Los Angeles. That's only in San Francisco. Or do you, does your mind not go to the only in San Francisco, only in Los Angeles type reaction at all? No, I think I certainly have some of that. I, I, again, I just don't know if I necessarily tie it to, to, Asian American cultural formations. I mean, things things like the scratch scene, you know, had a much more intense um, kind of existence in the Bay than it did in mm-hmm. L.A. And again, it, it was big in L.A. I mean, don't get me wrong at all, right. but um, just the kind of sheer insularity of it in the Bay was unlike any place else because you just had this insane critical mass of, of DJs uh, involved in the Bay for it. So something like uh, you know, something like the Minna, uh, you know, uh, or, oh God, there was a, a place in the Mission District, which which name is, is it was at the Elbow Room? No, not the Elbow Room. I, oh, I feel embarrassed. I can't remember <laughs> it now. But it used to be this place where the Invisible Scratch Pickles would have, I feel like it was like a Wednesday night thing where mm. it, they would just get together with other interested parties and just scratch for like four to five hours. Mm. And I mean, I'm sure maybe something like that existed in LA, but to me, this idea that there'd be a basement club where, where Qbert and Mike and Short and all of their buddies would get together and just practice turntablism 
you know, on a Wednesday night, that feels like a really specifically San Francisco thing that maybe didn't exist uh, in any other place um, because you could do that in the Bay. Uh, mm -hmm. The stakes weren't as high in terms of needing, you know, the, the, the standards of what a successful night comprised of. Um, maybe that's all it really took. Right. Um, so I think beyond that, there are probably a lot of other huge examples that for because my brain is fried right now, <laughs> I'm not coming up with. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of differences. But I think for me, perhaps because I grew up in really in both cities, even though I recognize there are major differences between mm. them, I also think they share a lot of affinities for one another. And so that right. the ways in which ac cultural activities manifest in both, to me, I tend to see them as really um, – they're just different points on the same continuum rather than being right. like completely different spheres. We make a big deal about Northern Southern California, but look at the East West divide. That's pretty stark. We're kind of San Francisco, Los Angeles, you know, we're cool. We're through the same compared to that. Right. Right. I mean, in some ways I think the bigger split is East side, West side, Los Angeles to <laughs> yeah. me seems more important of a distinction compared to it's like made the much area of. Uh, or, or LA. Um, right. But where do you draw the line? East and West side. That's the question. Right. La Cienega. Well, that's yeah, where that's where I draw the line. I always like that. I mean, we're getting off into a tangent, but I always find that debate around where does the east side begin <laughs> as if there were some kind of official designation. I mean, right. there are forms of official designation. I guess there's like what that coalition of east side neighborhoods and they get to kick out neighborhoods for not being sufficiently east side. <laughs> but like, you know, the whole idea of east side, west side, these are these are formations in our imagination. Ultimately, right. it's not like you can pin it down to a freaking, you know, <laughs> city block and say, no, this is the dividing line. I mean, that line's always moving. None so, shall cross. Um, but that said, with that, you know, with that qualifier put out there, I definitely feel like as someone who lived on the West side, when we first moved back to LA, I definitely feel like I'm an East sider. I mean, this is where right. I grew up. Something about being in the shadows of the St. Gabriel's is important to me. And it's part of how I just identify myself as an Angelino. So, mm. I mean, it's not like these divides are false. It's just that I would never say, you know, if you're in Los, you know, Feliz and you consider yourself an East Sider, no, you can't be like, you know, I'm not that invested in mean, in, in, in patrolling the, the border in that sense. <laughs> and it's here safely far east of the border in South Pasadena. I've been speaking with our guest today on the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast, Oliver Wang. He's a DJ, a podcaster, a teacher of sociology at Cal State Long Beach, a writer on a variety of topics, Asian American popular culture and more. He's the author of the new book, Legions of Boom, Filipino American mobile DJ crews in the San Francisco Bay Area. Oliver, thanks so much. Thank you, Colin. This was such a pleasure to talk with you. It's been the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the LARB at LAReviewofbooks.org or me at colinmarshall.org. Thanks.